Go ahead. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, today I'm going to be discussing my involvement in the Swift Poems Project, uh, specifically how I have been involved in encoding, <clears throat> excuse me, and designing for a forthcoming digital edition in support of the Swift Poems Project, as well as precisely how this process, particularly the implementation of the UI, has been structured in such a way as to support a migration from a legacy system. Uh, so firstly, I'm going to introduce uh, our two researchers. We have uh, James Woolley, um, Emeritus Professor of English at Lafayette College. He's still very actively involved in the, the project, as well as Stephen Carrion, the uh, uh, Associate Professor of English at the University of Missouri, and uh, of course myself. And um, if you'll please forgive me, I'm just going to try and give a very brief overview and history of the Swift Poems Project because I feel that it's absolutely necessary in order to contextualize the work that I'm going to, to discuss that's relevant to the, to the symposium. So um, originally our, our researchers, Woolley, uh, see, James Woolley and Stephen Carrion, sought to archive poems attributed to Jonathan Swift. Uh, this began in 1987 and it's really been comprised of, of three processes. Um, identifying and cataloging primary sources, um, the digital transcription of these, these primary sources, um, and this really encompasses copy typing, encoding, and annotating the primary sources, and how, the, how this is done I'm going to detail in a moment. And finally, the collation of the, uh, these digital transcriptions in, through which they're able to identify the copy text as well as the, the variant text for any given poem that they've accessioned. Uh, so discussing briefly the, the role of the libraries at Lafayette, uh, we began supporting the work of James Woolley back in 2009. Um, he consulted with us for assistance with this project and then our visual resources curator uh, developed a set of Microsoft Access databases which basically uh, further enhanced their abilities to, to structure the, the metadata that they've been capturing from external sources uh, when they identified primary sources for this, this project. Um, in fact, it, it, it accelerated the, the project to such an extent that in 2012, uh, the NEH awarded them a scholarly editions grant for the project. Um, and in, in, included within this grant uh, was the explicit support for the development of a digital edition, which is going to be integrated, I believe, into uh, forthcoming volumes of the Cambridge edition of the works of Jonathan Swift. Um, I am within the Digital Scholarship Services Department of the libraries, and I, uh, I, was, I joined um, around the time when uh, the department itself agreed to support this project formally as we were planning a migration to the Fedora Commons Digital Object Repository. So um, detailing some of the process that's involved, um, the researchers identifying catalog primary sources, uh, the sources themselves are 18th century printed and manuscript texts. Um, to this day, approximately 6,500 manuscripts have been identified and cataloged. Uh, regrettably, very few digital surrogates for the printed and manus manuscript texts are actually available, and even fewer are going to be accessible to the public. They're protected over copyright. So regrettably, we don't really have the option of offering an image repository anytime in the near future to support this kind of work. Um, however, the metadata extracted for these, these sources it should be um, briefly addressed. Uh, bibliographic metadata is just uh, extracted from external catalogs. Uh, probably the most significant source that they use is the, the ESTC or the English Short Title Catalog. Um, this is, goes through also a process of, of manual curation. The researchers themselves will identify whether or not an author attribution is authoritative. And further, um, given that not all poems are going to be cataloged with an authoritative title, in all cases, consistently, an internal identifier is used to reference the poems as a result. So here is the actual um, primary source of the digital transcription of the primary source that is produced during this project. As you can see, it is not TEI. Um, now, the transcripts themselves are created using an application uh, known as Notabene. Uh, Notabene encodes textual structure using a system of tags known as mode codes. Um, as you can see, it's a, it's a shallow form of uh, approach to tagging. You, you can't recursively tag mode code sequences. Uh, further, these researchers have extended this tagging system in that one can, will find these tag sequences of, of, of uh, bytes uh, followed by an interpunct character and then some sort of a string literal. 
Um, further, there are also instances where um, annotative markup doesn't even require these mode, to, mode code tags. They, they use uh, backslashes in order to, to delimit these sequences. So obviously, when, it, when we first approached this project within Digital Scholarship Services, uh, preserving these, these transcripts um, in the Nota Bene format came with far too many challenges. We, we couldn't really support this. Uh, particularly, it's worth noting that they have been using Nota Bene Release 3.0 from 1988 consistently to this day. Uh, in order to support this work, they, they use a virtualized environment if, for Microsoft DOS, uh, DOSBox, for those who, who are maybe users of this. Um, we are not in the position where we had the digital infrastructure to provide virtualization on demand. So it became clear that um, the, you know, the TEIP5 was going to provide us with a robust enough data model in order to support uh, a migration onto this new format that would also be standardized. It's, it's an open format that would be in, easily interchangeable. Uh, and finally, it, it would probably provide a much more effective solution for preservation. So here one can see um, some of the, the, the uh, TEI XML that we've been generating throughout this process in, um, in, in Emacs. Uh, so regrettably, we couldn't actually encode the TEI P5 manually. We simply didn't have the resources. We didn't have the, um, the, the labor available to us. We didn't have the time to go through all 6,500 digital transcripts and undertake this. So. Basically, an API in, in Ruby using the Nokogiri Jammer library was developed in order to support a minimalistic um, implementation of the TEI that would basically support a transformation from these Nota Bene digital transcripts. Now, it became very clear that viewing the TEI XML itself was going to be of limited value. Um, the researchers themselves have been very closely tied to using Nota Bene, which rendered the, 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 um, the, the markup within the, the digital transcripts. So um, the most straightforward approach was basically to just start rapidly prototyping um, an application that generated some styled HTML5 using standard Twitter bootstrap framework and uh, you know, a, a combination of XSL uh, style sheets for the, to support the transformation. And uh, I mean, as, as others have cited, we try to draw heavily from the agile uh, software development methodologies um, in which you know, our stakeholders have access to these continuously improving or maturing prototypes rather than having these more staged, uh, more, more mature products. And um, this all approach, we attempted to also, in this case, we attempted to also draw upon the pair, pair programming technique that one finds within the extreme programming methodology. And uh, I'll detail that uh, momentarily. But, but basically, uh, within the current prototype UI, this is what the output that the end user sees. Now, there are obviously going to be limits with our approach. I mean, automated TEI transformation is not something that is really going to be uh, something that's granular enough to enable researchers to undertake actual textual criticism. Um, however, what we found is that we could, undertake, we could try to offset some of this, these issues by making this process more collaborative. Um, James Woolley and myself will typically occupy a shared physical environment in which he will undertake the digital transcription of any given text within the Nota Bene, and I will be working to actively modify the Ruby API, generate um, the rendered styled HTML5 output, and we'll basically iterate on sets of transcripts in order to ensure that any feature requests that come through to me aren't coming through email, but uh, are physically undertaken, well, they're physically requested while I'm in the office. Um, uh, it certainly provides a great degree of quality control over this process. I mean, uh, the, the researchers can actually see directly the output that they're going to be generating. Um, further, uh, it provides me with the opportunity to, to work very closely with our stakeholders in extending the API, uh, modifying the XSL or the CSS. And finally, I found that, it, you know, when it came to structuring um, <coughs> Uh, deliver, uh, delivery for uh, certain digital, for sets of digital transcripts, for feature sets uh, within any given uh, development sprint or iteration. Uh, this was just extremely valuable. But as I previously stated, actual textual criticism isn't going to be enabled by this pr approach alone. I mean, uh, the researchers still need to identify variant readings within a given text, and further, critical apparata are not explicitly encoded within the Nota Bene transcripts. That's a, a major limitation that we, we simply can't overcome in, through any automated process. 
Uh, so, I mean, collation for the Swift Promise project is not actually something that we brought to our researchers within the libraries. Uh, originally, they were actually using a FoxPro program in order to generate uh, a, a collation for any given set of Nota Bene digital transcripts. Um, Visualization was used to identify variation. Uh, tokenization was customized. I mean, they weren't using a standard tokenizer. And a set of controlled characters symbolized differences in structure. So this is why you see these, these ampersands and these pipes. Um, and in some of these cases, I believe it's the tilde characters, these are actually indicating um, gaps. Uh, in other words, alignment wasn't fully supported by this Fox Pro program. Now, obviously, um, scoping a collation interface for the digital edition seemed to be something that would be absolutely necessary for our stakeholders. Uh, I mean, it, it would provide us with the opportunity to extend the collation features that were currently offered through this Foxville program. Um, so what we were looking to implement, we would still tokenize lines. Uh, we initially attempted to pre-process the text and use uh, the pen tree bank tokenizer. We found that working with a custom tokenizer and abstracting the, the, the tokenizer that the end user can actually select for any given collation job was a bit, a bit more advantageous. Um, alignment is addressed without the use of these controlled characters that one sees. And finally, the edit distance between the tokens can be calculated. Uh, one doesn't rely you know, um, solely upon uh, uh, visualization in order to distinguish between uh, variations in the text. Um, further experimental features could also be introduced to this collision interface. Uh, we've been testing a part of speech tagging, and we've had some limited success with a pre-trained uh, perceptron tagger. For those who, who use the Python natural language toolkit, that's the default tagger that you have. Um, there are more performant approaches, and again, undertaking, you know, supporting these features in the digital edition would just give us the opportunity to try and, and you know, increase um, optimized performance of the app. So here you find the actual um, prototype form interface that supports some of the features that I've, I've just outlined. Again, the, you know, the abstraction for the tokenizer, the part of speech tagging. Um, and I'm going to detail a bit about the mode right now, what that means. Um, the collation can also be used to address flaws in encoding, and this is key in quality control. By default, all un unencoded Nota Bene markup has been stripped from the TEI, so anything that we haven't been able to handle during the encoding process, we just strip it out. Um, this is advantageous in that users will be able to collate the text and visualize the differences. They don't need to have any real access to documentation detailing this approach using Nota Bene within the project. But for the, the researchers themselves, they are still going to be able to visualize exactly how the Nota Bene was transformed. And for those more anomalous cases, which invariably will arise, it provides them with a means by which to contact me and provide me with you know, very granular, detailed feedback. Uh, you know, exactly stating what it was or what the case was that wasn't encoded, what should be encoded, perhaps where styling could be improved for any given uh, sequence of, of Nota Bene mode codes, things of that nature. And uh, currently, we, we visualize the, the differences between, well, the textual variation uh, on a line-by-line -line basis using a heat map. This was just the most straightforward means of, of rendering these differences. So here one finds a, a prototype interface for a collation for the, the poem given the identifier, or the set of poems resolving to the <coughs> identifier 640 dash. And here we have a uh, 640 dash 35D dash selected as an arbitrary copy text and two additional variants. And you can see here I've actually preserved the Nota Bene markup. Um, these, these pipes are actually indicating um, indentations, but otherwise you'll see, you know, uh, just basic straightforward shading in order to provide the end user with a visualization for the edit distance that's been calculated by the, the application. Now, regarding forthcoming features for, uh, for this digital edition, um, uh, the stakeholders, the, really the researchers have driven improvement, uh, the requirements for the UI. Um, interviewing and testing for public users must be undertaken at this point in time or sometime soon. Um, I mean, obviously, much of the interface development work that has been uh, undertaken has really been specialized for our researchers who have been working with this legacy system. Um, extending the UI features using uh, JavaScript frameworks is also something that we feel is extremely desirable. Ideally, uh, a, a digital, I mean, currently, the digital edition that we have implemented is in the Tornado framework for Python. Um, ideally, we would like to be able to leverage a JavaScript framework such as AngularJS or React. 
um, given that it reduces the UI to a set of modular components that we can more readily isolate and, and test. And uh, also it will require us to provide a RESTful API or set of RESTful API endpoints so that, you know, ideally if, if someone wanted to repurpose any component in this application stack for their own means, I think this would make things a bit more readily accessible. Um, we also still have the outlying problem of preservation. Um, to give a bit more history uh, regarding my institution, we are actually in Island Dora. Well, we, we initially implemented Island Dora in 2012. And um, within the Island Dora community, there was quite some support for, for ingesting and managing TEI resources within the Fedora Commons repository. Um, we have since uh, become much more actively involved in the Project Hydra community as well as began uh, undertaking the migration for uh, Fedora Commons 4. And this right now is being addressed for some of our, our systems, which includes Islandor and a legacy um, implementation of DSpace. Uh, but ideally, this would encompass the modeling of TEI resources in Hydra. Uh, ideally, this would be done in such a manner as to ensure that the bibliographic metadata that we've been capturing or that our researchers have been capturing using these Microsoft Access databases can be exposed um, in RDF using a graph store. Um, ideally, I hope that there is some community-backed solution within the Hydra community that would allow us to, to leverage some of the, the data modeling initiatives that could more readily expose TEI resources uh, as linked data at some level, but I think it's obviously too early a time to begin discussing you know, any possible transformation directly from TEI into RDF. So um, I thank you very much for your attention. I would, I would like to please ask for any and, and all questions and, and feedback.